wanted to share some announcements and an update on our trip. But the first announcement is that for you, uh, dads here today, we have a gift for you on your way out. It's uh, duct tape and Slim Jims. Uh, so happy Father's Day. I don't know who's, I, I, I keep getting asked whose idea was this, I don't know, but it was genius. Uh, way better than a chocolate bar, just, just saying. Um, so happy Father's Day, grab that on the way out. And also, in front of you, you have cards. Uh, we want to do something like we do for Mother's Day. We want you guys to nominate two dads that are in this room that will, at the end of service, uh, be able to win a $25 gift card to, did we ever find out where it was? Some great restaurant in Bedford. Huh? It's really good. Says Jeff. So would you all take a minute right now to grab a slip and, and write the name of a dad who you think deserves uh, to, be, to be honored, to be, you know, told, hey, this is, this is an amazing dad. We want to honor you. Here's a $25 gift card. Yes, those cards, the Connect cards. So you take a minute, and then we want you all to pass them inside when you're done, here to the inside of the pews, and we're going to collect them with a couple baskets. Give you guys like 30 seconds. If you can't come up with a name in 30 seconds, then maybe they don't deserve to be. What's that? None of my pens work? Someone didn't want your husband to win. So if you could start passing it to the inside now, we're going to collect them. So I also wanted to share an update on our uh, service trip that we had this past week to California. A group of 20 of us left, and as you know, we had to change our trip. We pivoted from going to Mexico and, and building um, and, and working with Casa del Abuelo, which was the place to, to, that helps the abandoned elderly. Um, we, we had to move, uh, move away from that because of a travel advisory. But while we were gone in California, I, I received uh, pictures that the project is it's mostly finished. The, the building's mostly finished. As you know, we're still able to fund the project even though we couldn't go. So it was just cool to see that other churches from other areas stepped up and they were able to do the work that we couldn't physically do, the church, local churches that were there. So that was cool to see, and we'll share pictures on that as it's, as it's finished. But it looks like it's pretty close to finish, so that was awesome to hear while I was gone. But uh, so we didn't do that. Instead, we went to a church in Nyland, California, which is in the desert. It's an impoverished area. There's a lot of needs there. And we decided to do a VBS there. And it seems that the whole trip, things kept changing. And uh, after, after some time, we just had to, to say, you know what, it looks like God's trying to do something. And instead of us trying to figure out exactly how to, how to change this all, we just need to let God move. And when we did, we think he did great things. Um, so I wanted to share, I, I wanted to let these, before I continue to talk about the trip, I brought these guys up here. I totally did not just ask them to do this last minute because they were sitting right here next to me, but I asked them to share something that stood out to them that impacted them on the trip. Share your name, please. Um, I'm Grant Thorne, and I just went on this trip last minute. Like, I decided a week and a half before the trip I was going to go, and I'm very glad I did because on this trip, I just, while we were there, I thought we were just, it was just going to be a VBS, like, whatever, no big deal. But the way just that we bonded with these kids in, like, that short amount of time was just crazy to me. Like, I had kids the first day coming up asking to be my friend, and then, like, every single day whenever we left, like, they were giving us hugs, telling us bye like asking us, hey, when are you guys going to come back? And I just thought that was super cool how quick we bonded with those kids. Hello, I'm Ryan Wright, and uh, I learned a lot during this trip, but um, one thing that stood out was how, how we all doubted God, how uh, God turned this trip upside down. We're supposed to originally go to Mexico, but that all fell through with the travel advisory, and I'm sure many of us were a little worried that... Um, we weren't going to have as big an impact for God's kingdom as we would have if we went to Mexico. But um, as Proverbs says, uh, we did not lean on God's own understanding. So I'm glad uh, what happened happened. God was behind all of it. Um, and I learned a lot, and I might have even learned more than I would have if 
uh, plans haven't been changed, so I'm really excited about that. And uh, thank you. And we had a really big group, and and like I said, we 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 through our talks, we said we just need to let God move. We need to we need to see what is going to happen, and and yeah, the plan changed. So it, instead of uh, who's that? I'm gonna write my name in there. Instead of us doing this trip, we made so many changes, and even on on the changes we made, those changes changed. And uh, what ended up happening, we ended up in the mornings working in this ranch house that we got to stay at. Nope, that's... We did fun stuff when we got there. <laughs> we had to. We're in San Diego. Come on. So we arrived, we arrived to San Diego, and we spent a, a day hanging out, so we had fun stuff. Uh, Ryan bought a giant burrito. Uh, no big deal. Uh, this is... This is the house that we stayed at, and it was a, a ranch house, and um, I told the youth that as a thank you for them letting us stay at the house, we would clean it up, and we would work, so it, it was going to challenge our youth to kind of work for what they get, so because we get a free stay at this ranch house, we would work, and uh, Jeff, you're way better at this than I am. So we did a lot of th uh, things, we removed cabinets, and an old fireplace, or uh, wood stove, and uh, worked around the house. Uh, Cooper Adams painted the whole house by himself. That was pretty impressive. Um, just a lot of work. And the house looked pretty nice at the end uh, compared to what it was. The pictures don't do it justice. It still looks like a house in the desert, uh, but it is. There's, you know, nothing I can do about that. But it was cool that we got to stay there. And at the end of the week, we told the teens that actually this house isn't, isn't just uh, for us. We, we were fixing up this house because a local youth pastor who had spoken at our fall retreat here last year uh, he and his wife were going to move in it, and, and we got to fix up this house for them to bless them too. So we got something out of it, and we got to fix up the house for someone else. So that was cool, and they didn't know that. Um, we also got to work with uh, this church in Ireland. We set up the VBS. Right away, we, we, we got there, and we started setting up. The place looked amazing, and we were just so excited to do this VBS with kids. We got to partner with CityServe, and this was crazy. My brother helps uh, run this ministry called CityServe that they take a lot of things uh, from, from Costco or any furniture places that they have not, it just returns or things that they wouldn't take. City Surf puts it in this giant warehouse, and my brother texts him, and he said, hey, if, if there's anything there that you guys may want to take to Nyland, go ahead. Uh, things churches didn't want. And I thought, you know, if the churches didn't want them, what, what could we use from it? So we got there, and I told the teens, if anything in this warehouse looks like the kids would like an island, let's take it. And, and we had permission to take whatever we wanted, so we looked around, and immediately as we start looking, we start seeing things that, from us being with the kids already for a few days, we already knew that they were going to love. And at the end of it all, we walked away with all the stuff. And you may not be able to see well from this picture, but this is thousands of dollars worth of stuff. We're taking thousands of diapers, uh, uh, scooters, and skateboards, and slides, and pools, and things that just... It was crazy for us that people wouldn't want this stuff, but these kids in Ireland were like, their minds were blown that, that we had. And they weren't like cheap things either. I mean, the scooters were like $200 scooters. And they just had a bunch of them in the warehouse. And, and they're like, no one wants them. And I'm like, every single one of these kids in Ireland wants a scooter or a skate. That's how they get around. That's how they get to church. And it was just, it was, it was crazy. So uh, those are the diapers. Lots of diapers. There's a lot of, young, un unfortunately, there's a lot of young moms there. And not a lot of help in Ireland. So it was awesome to leave all these diapers at the church. So now the church becomes a place where you can come and get diapers and, and, uh, and they get to meet you, talk with you, minister to you, and, and give you diapers. So uh, we thought that was awesome. Again, awesome. We couldn't plan that. And, and, and that was pretty cool. Um, and this is the last day. On the last day of our VBS, we could have just left without doing this and the kids would have still loved it. We, we fed them. We played games with them. We gave them Bible lessons. We could have called it a day. But it was so last minute how this opportunity came up. Do you want to come to the warehouse and take these things? We said, sure. We go look, and we get all these things. And when we give these gifts to these kids, and their minds are just blown that we, that we would do this. Um, I shared first service. My favorite memory was this kid named Ray, who he, he always has this blank expression. But we gave him the scooter, and his, his jaw, he was just, I'm like, Ray, are you okay? And he's like, I'm so happy. And... 
and, and he just couldn't believe it, like a new scooter for me, and, and, and it, was, it blew his mind, blew my mind, and he was, the kids were riding around the fellowship hall in the church, and it's just like frowned upon because it's an old church, and the pastor was, he looked away, he's like, I can't see this, um, but it was awesome. At the end of it all, what I want you guys to, to, to know is that we want to thank you because we couldn't have done this without your support. We went and we did the work, but it was with your support, your, your financial support, but also your spiritual support, your prayers. So many of you texting us, letting us know that you're praying for us. All the stuff that we did, we did in the name of the Lord, but with your support, and we want to thank you for that. All the stuff that we did here, uh, you're a part of that too. So I wanted to share that, that update with you, and thank you for letting our youth group experience this. They were, I, I saw that their lives were changed. My life was changed. The leaders, all the talking that we did was just an amazing time to see the Lord move, and, and it was with your help. So, so thank you for that. Um, that's, that's the end of my announcement um, on the mission trip. So thank you guys again. And if you have any questions about the trip or anything, I'll be out in the foyer. You can catch me later. So thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, we, uh, uh, first of all, again, happy Father's Day. Glad you're here. I was trying to brainstorm ahead of time how to talk about uh, what I wanted to talk about this uh, day, because I don't, I don't really normally do a whole sermon just on Mother's Day or a whole sermon just on Father's Day. We used to try to mention it and try to hit on different things, but trying to think about it and how I could relate it and what it would connect. When I was, when I was younger, and my kids, I guess, notably were younger, sometimes they would say something like, we want to give you the best day ever, Dad. What do you want for the best day ever? And, and it was always hard to know what to ask for on those sorts of things because it's kind of hard for me to manufacture the best day ever for me. I don't know what exactly I would want to happen for that to be. So it would make you think. And I kind of got to thinking about it uh, during this week when I was thinking well, what my best day ever would have been, what day would that, would that have been. Now for some of you guys, it may be easy to think about that. Well, it was the day the doctor told me I was healthy. You know, I was clear. All the stuff was gone. Or maybe it was, uh, it was uh, when uh, some promotion came in or when you finally achieved some big goal you'd had, uh, maybe an inheritance or some special surprise gift that you didn't know you were going to get. Sometimes it, may, it might be a wedding. My wedding, best day I ever had. Or, 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 or when your kid was born. Or if you have lots of kids, you, you, you have several best days and you love each of those days just as much as the others. It might be like that. But I don't know, I was trying to think about it. And I, I, it, it, the, the, the thing that stands out to me as my best day ever, it, it was weird, the things that kind of clicked in me. One, one uh, day that kind of popped up, and I remember thinking about it at the time. We were on the Colorado River in, near California, between Yuma there and, and California, and we're on this boat, and we're going very fast. And uh, I'm up on the front of the boat, and uh, we're just skipping across the water. And... And uh, the sun is starting to go down on, on, on the, in the west there, and, and the wind's in my face, and I'm thinking, this is pretty good. I remember thinking it then, this is pretty good. I'm surrounded by friends and family, and, and this is a pretty good day. I remember being a kid. There's a picture. My mom and dad still have the picture. They, they have it up somewhere. But uh, when I was a kid, and I'm, I'm 10 years old or 11, somewhere in there, and we went to Spring Mill, us and our cousins, and we just played all day long. At the end of the day, we're taking a picture on one of the bridges, and I'm wearing this yellow uh, Kiss Rock and Roll All Night t-shirt, which was a really good t-shirt if you've never seen it. And, and I'm in the picture, and we're in the picture, and, and that was a pretty good day. It, it, but, but what stands out to me about my best days, the days I say, man, that was a pretty good day, is usually I'm at peace, you know, I'm at peace, I'm happy, I'm, 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 I'm at, everything is kind of smooth. That's always the stuff, and it's hard to manufacture that. It's hard to make that happen. If you, you might even want to give somebody their best day, but it's hard to do it because it's hard to, to make all those things happen. Well, taking that thought, right? I had that earlier for my brainstorming there I was thinking about, and then I take that thought, and I'm thinking with David, we've a whole sermon series on David, and what would David's best day have been? And there's a, there's a couple of candidates I think, that would have been his best day. Certainly the day he becomes king, that would have been a pretty good day. Most people are going to become king, and he does, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, it might have been when he was anointed. You know, the, the, if you don't remember that story, uh, uh, the, the important guy, the important religious guy comes to David's house, going to anoint one of your sons to be king. The brothers don't even invite David. He's the baby brother. They, the, he's left out in the field. This is the brother, the other, the other older brothers. You might be adopted. They're telling him that kind of stuff, you know. And so he's out in the field. All the important brothers are there. One after another, uh, Samuel says, no, it's not one of these guys. And finally they say, well, I guess bring David in. It's him. 
And as David's getting anointed in front of all these brothers, I think that'd probably be a pretty good day. But, but, but good for weary. Goliath, when he kills Goliath, when he kills Goliath, that would have been a pretty good day. And uh, nobody else was brave enough to attack Goliath, but David was. And he goes out and fights Goliath. And, and when he gets done, the whole army cheers and rushes forward. And, and uh, he meets the king that night. And, uh, and, and uh, they have a big meeting together. And, and the next day, it says that women are singing his song. They, they, they've written a song for like, like Beatlemania, but for David. And they're singing his song. And it mentions this song three different times in the Old Testament. It's like a number one hit. People uh, loved it. It's catchy. Uh, the Philistines said, don't they sing this at their dances? It's like that peppy, uh, uh, catchy song. And, and I think that'd be a pretty good day. I think all that would be pretty good. But when I was thinking about David and trying to think about what David's best day ever was, I think it's, it's in 2 Samuel 7. And I think it's the kind of thing that even if you, if you like to read the Bible, if you studied a little bit about David through the years and have kept up with David, it might be one of those things that you, didn't, you never really paid attention to. Just kind of skip right past. And it's because most of David's stories, there's action. You know, there's, there's the, uh, blood and violence or, or there's drama with relationships. So David has a lot of great stories. But, but, but this one doesn't pop off the page like that, not for those reasons. But I do think it was probably his very best day uh, uh, in, in his whole life. And I would bet that even now in heaven, if you could ask David, he would say, yeah, that was it. That was probably the best day that I ever had. And so I wanted to kind of focus on that. And first of all, talk about what happened to David, but then also talk about how it kind of reveals something about God, this whole thing, and, and, and then maybe how that relates to you. And hopefully we'll, we'll get all that done and, and be out of here in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. So, um, so here's the story. It goes, it goes like this here. It says, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies uh, around him, he says to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar, and the ark of God's out there in a tent. And, and Nathan says, well, okay, we'll do something. Whatever you got in mind, go do it. Lord's with you. And, and, and actually, this is not terrible advice most of the time. If you're, if you're trying to live the right way, you're trying to put God first, you're trying to, to do the right thing, uh, for the most part, for the most part, you can trust your instinct. You can trust your gut. If you're, if you're doing the right things, you know, you're trying to live your life the right way, for the most part, that's what Nathan says. He said, I'm sure you're on the right track. You're doing everything else right. But it says that night that God spoke to Nathan. And he says, go tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Am I, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? He says, whenever I moved with the Israelites, did I ever say uh, to any of them that I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? In other words, who do you think you are, David? I mean, I don't, if I had wanted a house, I'd have told you. You don't have to do anything for me. And, and, and that's kind of an interesting picture about God right there, too, that, that God doesn't care that much about buildings, that God doesn't care that much about, about that. I mean, he, there is going to be a temple coming, and, and he certainly does care about that. But, but this does reveal something about the heart of God, and that, that's curious. But, but God goes on. He says, he says, now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture. You were tending the flock, and I appointed you to be the ruler. I mean, you were just a kid. God says, and, and your brothers didn't even think you had it in you. I mean, your own family thought you weren't the right guy, and I saw it. God says, I saw your heart. I knew what kind of guy you were, and I took you out of the pasture. I took you out of the tending the flock and made you the whole king of everything. And he says, now I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you like one of the greatest men in the world. And, and that has happened, by the way. People who don't know anything about the Bible, who would never, ever, ever in a million years go to church, if you say, David and late David and Goliath, they have some inkling about what that is. He is one of the most famous people who ever lived. And people have some sense about him, and that, that actually came true. Just like God said, he says, I'm going to provide a place for my people Israel, and I'm going to plant them so that they can have a home of their own and, and won't be disturbed. He says, I'm going to give you rest from all your enemies. And the Lord declares to you that the Lord's, I'm going to establish a house for you. So this whole thing starts because David says, I'm going to build God a house like a temple. And God says, tell you what, I'm going to build you a house. And, and what he means by that is I'm going, to, I'm going to build your legacy. I'm going to build your family. I'm going to, he, he explains it. He says, he says, when your days are over and you rest with, with uh, your ancestors, I'm going to raise up your offspring to succeed you and your own flesh and blood and will establish his kingdom. And my love will, this is the important part, my love will, will, will never be taken away from you as I took it away from Saul when I removed him from before you. He says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. 
and your throne, he says, will be established forever. Now, it's ridiculous, insane, just a crazy promise for God to make. Unlike anything he made before, you, you can't find an example of anything like it. Abraham's covenant is close, but it doesn't have the same uh, same punch to it that this is. And, and after this, people will talk about being a son of David or David's kingdom or David's throne. This becomes an important theme the rest of the Bible from, from this chapter until the very end becomes kind of an important thing to talk about. And if you know anything about David, it, he's not like always the best dude. I mean, he's, he's kind of bloody and violent. Um, um, he, he doesn't have a, a, a great a relationship record with women. I mean, and even by the standards of the day, it's not a completely great record of relationships with women. In our day, with Me Too and everything, it would be insane, some of the things. But in that day, even, it's just it's not always, and he's not a good dad, which is kind of ironic on Father's Day. There's, there's a verse that says that David never interfered with his kids, never asked them why they were doing the things they did. He just wasn't, wasn't that good at being a dad. I mean, there's a lot of things about David that were kind of flawed. And yet God says, but I, in, in essence, I see your heart. I see your heart. I've always seen your heart, he says. When you were just tending the sheep, I saw your heart. I, I, I know who you are. I, I know you want this. And so I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you based on what you want, not totally on what you do. And this is a, an aspect of God that's not totally been revealed scripturally. It, it's an aspect of God's grace that we've not totally seen uh, before and not clearly like this. this you, you could argue this is one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible and, and it, it's a chapter that sneaks past people sometimes. They don't see the weight of it, what God's saying here. And, and, but David does. David sees the weight of it and so it says he, he goes in and prays. He, who am I, sovereign Lord? Who's my family that you would do something like this for me? He, he can't believe it. I mean, I mean, when I look at me, God, and I see all my strengths and weakness, I can't believe you'd do something like this for me. He said, how great you are, sovereign Lord. And there's no one like you, and there's no God but you. And you, you as we've all heard from with our own ears. And who's like your people, Israel? He says, you've separated your people as your very own forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Sovereign Lord, your God, and your covenant, he says, is trustworthy. So what he's saying here, covenant's a new kind of word in this, this whole the, the, the contract you're offering, God, he says, I trust it. I know you'll come through because, God, you're faithful. You, I, I know if you tell me you're going to do it, you're going to do it. And so he says, you've promised these things to your servant, so, so, so do it. He says, be pleased to bless the house of your servant. I mean, bless me, God. He says, he says come and, and shine all over me. Help me, God, to understand this. He says, that, it, that I can continue forever in your sight. For you, sovereign Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. Now, you could make a whole other sermon here, and I do want to allude to some of this, but I don't want to stay here too long. David's prayer is kind of an interesting example, and it's different than how most American Christians would pray. Uh, he's humble. He starts with humble. Hey, who am I? You know, God, I, I've done nothing to deserve this kind of grace. I've done nothing to deserve this kind of favor. I've done nothing to deserve this kind of reward. So he starts off very humble, but then he's very bold. Okay, God, you say you're going to do it. Well, do it. I mean, you say you're going to bless me, God. I mean, bless me. You say you're going to lead me. Well, lead me. Help me to... I mean, he's, he's, he, he's, he's asking God very directly. It's not a, a weak request, like, God, if it be your will, maybe someday you can help. doesn't do any of that. He, he's real bold about it. And, and, and the risk for us of praying like that is that God's not a genie. You can't rub the lamp and God will, will have to do what you say. Sometimes God does say no. And sometimes you'll ask God for something you really care about and the answer is no. And that, that always hurts your feelings, especially if you pray real bold. And sometimes because as Christians, we condition ourselves not to do that. You, God, if it be your will, maybe you'll want to do this thing. And you, you ask it in such a mealy-mouthed way that, that you're not really even expecting him to move. And, and David doesn't do that. I think that's interesting. And like I said, we, we could, you could do a whole sermon just on that. I think that but I, and I want to talk about it more, but, but that's, that's interesting. Now, there's a story... Um, 
uh, in the Old Testament. There's a guy named Elisha, and Elisha is approached by this widow, and she says to Elisha, my husband who just died owed a lot of money, and now the creditors are coming, and they're saying they're going to take my two sons and sell them for slaves. You got to help me. And Elisha said, well, I want to help you. Do you have anything at all that's valuable that you could sell? She said, well, I've got a little jar of olive oil. That's probably valuable. And so he says, okay, well, go borrow as many buckets and cans and jugs and jars as you can. Just borrow as many as you can and, and take them to your house and close the door and start filling them up with that bottle. Fill up as many as you can. So she does. She goes and gets this all that, and she comes back, closes the door, and she starts filling it up. And when one gets full, they put to the side and bring another one in, and it just keeps pouring out. And just keeps pouring out. And finally she says, okay, where's the next one? The boys say, well, there's no more. And then it stops. And, it's, it, and she's, she's able to sell all that stuff and, and pay off the debt. The miracle, though, is contingent on her faith in a pretty powerful way. If she had only asked her friends for three buckets, she would have gotten three buckets worth of miracle. If she asked them for 100, she gets 100 buckets. It really is up to her. How much do you want to ask and again, you could take this further than I intend for it to be. It's not a prosperity gospel kind of thing. It's not. So God can still say no. And sometimes God can use our lack to teach us things that he could never teach us in our, in our prosperity. And yet, I think sometimes the reason we don't get the things that we, we really want is we don't ask. And again, I'm not talking about a newer, nicer car or newer, nicer clothes. I mean, the stuff that you re- would make your best day ever. I want peace, God. I want rest. I want to know where I stand with you. I, I, want to, I want to have some sense, God, of where this is all going. And, and God absolutely wants to do those things for you. He absolutely wants to bless you. He is trustworthy. And we should be bold to ask. Okay, I want to talk more about that, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. With, with, with David, though, back, back to David, right? David has, has, said, has said what he said, and he's, you know, thank you, God. And this chapter, from here to the rest of the Bible, there's a change. It just keeps alluding back uh, 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 to it. Later uh, on, the, on the Christmas story, um, uh, there it goes, the angel says to Mary, uh, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. She says, you'll conceive and give birth to a son for you're to call him Jesus. And he'll be great. And he'll be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will put him on the throne of his father, David. I mean, that promise made to David all those years ago, now it's coming true. And, and he will reign. Jesus will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end what David was promised all those years ago, it's going to come true through Jesus. And, and, and the angel, talking to Mary, alludes to that promise. This covenant with David is the thing that changes everything. Now, there are in the Bible different covenants that come along. There was a covenant given to a guy named Abraham. He's an old man, and, and he's with God one night out in the, just praying by himself and, and all the stars in heaven. And, and God says, look at those stars. Count them if you can. He says, one day you'll have that many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-great-grandchildren. And, and it's pretty good news to Abraham. He's 75. He has no children. And it's, it, it makes it a little bit hard to believe, but he takes it. God says it, and he believes it. And, and God says to him in Genesis 12, one of those sons that I'm going to give you is going to bless the whole world. And again, there's this promise given to Abraham. And Abraham certainly blesses his best day ever. But, 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 but God is revealing about himself. I'm going to do it, God says. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to show you this thing. Moses uh, comes on later. The Abrahamic covenant is going to bless the whole world through you. Moses comes along. God says, here's how I want you to live. Shows us the law, writes it all out for you. These are the kinds of people I want you to be. And if you'll be those kinds of people, God says, I'm going to bless you and make you a kingdom of priests. You're going to change everything. And we see a little bit more of God, that God has a righteous expectation and, and, and that we have a hard time living up to it, but that if we'll pursue him, he'll bless us. And then David comes along, and, and God says, even if you can't pursue it, even if you can't get all the way there, I'm going to bless you. I'm, I'm going to bless you. And then Jeremiah comes along, and this is the last one in the Old Testament, the last big one. And Jeremiah says, uh, says this thing. He says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah, and it won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. 
when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, even though I was like a, a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time. He said, I'll put my law in their minds. I'll write it on their hearts. In other words, even if they, they don't want to study it, I'll, I'll help them study it. I'll help them do the right things. I, I'll put my spirit into their heart, and, they, and they'll, they'll follow. I'll be their God, he says. And they'll be my people. And, and no longer will, will somebody, uh, 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 no longer will somebody tell their neighbor, "Hey, come know the Lord," because they'll all know me. I mean, I'm going to put an ability of people to, to draw close to me that just never been there before, and I'm going to forgive their sins. I have a friend. He's a pretty good guy, and, and he needed to get a house, and he didn't have a lot of money to get a house, and, and it was kind of hard to find a house that he wanted and, and that he could afford. And so I had another friend who had a house to rent. So, well, here, I'll just introduce these two guys. Maybe they can talk to each other. And my first friend says to the second, oh, I'd love to look at your house, but I don't have much money. And the they start talking. And the second friend that I had was pretty impressed with the first friend. They said, wow, you know, it sounds like you got some things going on. I sure like to rent my house to you. Well, I'd like to have it, you know, and they talk him back and forth. And so finally the, the second guy goes, well, tell you what, I'll, uh, I can do it for 800 a month. And the second guy goes, well, it's pretty steep, but okay, I'll do it. And the first guy said, well, take what, um, 750 a month then. You know, just do 750. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, 700. And he just kept talking himself down. It was like he got down to like 625. He felt so guilty taking or something like that. 600 just kept getting lower and lower and lower. Felt guilty taking any money at all. Uh, that's what God's doing here. <laughs> that's what God's doing. God tells Moses, just be good and I'll bless you. And then to David, okay, even if you're not good, then I'll bless you. Then to Jeremiah, okay, I'll make you good. I'll make you good and I'll bless you. And it's like he's talking himself down. Why? Because he loves us. Because he, he loves us. I mean, I mean the, the, whole, the whole notion of what David has promised here. You look at David. Next week we're going to talk about David and Bathsheba. And, and it, it's like David's lowest moment. You know, just this terrible sin, awful stuff that he does. And it's all him. I say David and Bathsheba like she's partly, I guess she's in there, but she's not really to blame. It's all him. It's all such a mess. Such a mess, and, and, uh, and, and he's just, he has such a hard time being the right kind of guy, and, and, but, but God says, I'm just not going to quit on you. I'm just, I'm just not going to stop on you, and I think if you really, really understood that, if that really, really, really sunk into your head that the God in heaven has said, I'm never going to quit on you, I would think that would be your best day ever. So I want to think about that for a second, if we can, and I, I, want to, I want to think about that in the context of Father's Day. You know, as a dad, um, you're trying to build a house. I have found that it's easier to be a, a grandpa than a dad uh, because um, when I was a dad, I was just so busy doing everything else. You're, you're paying a mortgage, and you're... you're uh, you're hoping to keep your head above water. You're trying to prove yourself at work. You know, you're, you're trying to make some sort of a name. You're just a young guy starting out, and, and, uh, and so you're stressed. And sometimes the, the kid thing just makes that stress worse, and, and I wasn't always a good dad. When, when Alicia was, I was just holding Alicia. She's a little baby, and I had a friend of mine who's kind of got a sarcastic uh, bent to him. He says, you know, you're the reason she'll be in counseling one day. And I said, no, I didn't think about that till just now. But now that you've mentioned it, yeah, that's kind of awful to think about. And it's, uh, but it's true, right? I mean, as a dad, I, you think about all the different stupid things you did and, and different ways you let people down and, and, and things you cared too much about when you were younger that you should have known better, but you didn't. And, and I would give anything if I could undo that or undo this or fix that one thing. And, but you just do the best you can. And so a lot of times, if I'm being honest, my best isn't that good. And my best sometimes can be a little bit disappointing. And, 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 and so when I read God's promise to David there, and I see God's heart, right, which is later revealed through Jesus and, and revealed in the New Testament, that God is, is willing to show grace to me, a sinner, that, that God not only is going to put up with my bad, which he does, but that he's going he's gonna to love me in spite of it and, and, and pull me through it. And if I will continue to hold on to him, he will continue to shape me. And that God's not so much interested in, in that one bad thing I did 20 years ago as he is, does he have my heart or not? 
And, and if you really understood that, I mean, I've talked to people who say, who will say things like, I, you know, after, all, after what I did there, that one ugly, awful thing I did, and the whole town knows about it, or that one awful, ugly thing, and my whole family broke, and they know about it, and then the whole awful thing I did at work, and everybody just talks. I mean, I could never, God will never be able to forgive that. And you say it because you can't forgive yourself for it. But God's much more gracious than we are to ourselves. I mean, he's much more kind. And God knows what he's getting into. I mean, if you, if, you, if you forget that, you could read it and think, well, God makes this promise here in chapter 7. By chapter 11, David's no good, but God wishes he could take that back. But he doesn't. That's not how God's wired. He knows exactly what he's getting into. And he takes you anyway. And God's willing to take the risk and to commit to do the work that we cannot when I think about the kind of house that I could build, I mean, I know what I'm capable of. And God comes and does more. And God comes and does better. And if I hold on to him, he'll take all these broken pieces and he makes something pretty cool out of it. And I've seen that happen again and again and again and again and again. You know, the weird part is sometimes we get hurt we make two or three stupid decisions or two or three bad mistakes and we get hurt and we've sinned and, and it gets hard to want to come here. It's a weird thing because I think maybe we're afraid that somebody here will see us and judge us or somebody here will know and they'll look down on us and, 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 and maybe that's true. I, I mean, people, or people can be awful and sinners are everywhere, even in church. But, but God never does that. God, God never does that. And you can always come back to him. And he's what you need. And when you do come back to him, even in the middle of your awful weakness, like David, and you pray, God, who am I? What have I done? I mean, how, how could you care about me at all? After I mean, how, what, what, what am I about? But he does. And so you can come and be bold because of that, because it doesn't depend on you. Uh, Paul talks about this thing um, in, in Ephesians. He says, it's by grace you've been saved. Through faith, and it's not from you. It's nothing you do. It, it's, it's, you can't even brag about it. It, it, it. On your best day, you're still not good enough. On your worst day, you're still not bad enough. It, it, it's not about you. It's all about him. And we've been there 10,000 years. We'll just be getting started to think about how awesome that is. I had somebody ask me uh, in a Bible study this last week. They said, can you outgive God? They'd heard, they heard, had heard that expression. Some other preacher said, it can't outgive God. And can you outgive God? And what, what did I think about that? And, and it's complicated because sometimes, especially TV preachers, the reason why they use a phrase like that is, if you'll send me $100, God will give you 1000 And I don't know if that works. And any preacher that would say something like that, I, I would want to say, well, let's test it. You give me a hundred. Let's see if that happens. And, and uh, if you get a thousand back, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that works that way. So I, I don't, I don't think that's the thing. And, and if you're hoping that you could give a hundred away and get back a thousand, I don't know if I don't know if that that always it could, but I don't know if that's what he's saying. I, I think it's the stuff that makes the best day ever. I think it's the stuff that that really, I mean, peace and joy and and purpose. You know, that, that you're not just an accident walking around here, that there's a purpose to your life, that, that you're going someplace. And God wants to give all those things to you. You, you know, as, as men, as a man, you, you want to do something significant with your life. You want to make some sort of a difference in, in your life. You hope that at the end of your life, that when people talk about you, they respect how you lived. You know, I almost want that more than, what's the, the, the old cliche, I want that more than anything else. And, but, 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 but the path to that is not about me grabbing it real tight, it's about letting God lead. And I, I'm just as convinced about that as I've ever been, and, and that anybody can, can grab a hold of that. Even today, no matter where you're at, the same offer of grace that God gave to David, he offers that to you. I'll do for you what you cannot, God says. And I'll build you a legacy. And you and I together will be friends forever, he says. So I want to pray for you here at the end of the service. And I want to give you a chance, any one of you that need to pray to God or call out to him, to, to do that. And, uh, and, uh, 
and we'll have some people in the front who you can pray with. So let's, let's pray here together. Dear Lord God, I just thank you uh, for this group. Father, I ask you to, to put your hand on them and to bless them. And Father, there's, there's people here who are uh, in all different stages of relationship with you. Some who, who aren't connected at all and, and others who have been Christian for quite some time, uh, hot and cold. And probably a few who are lukewarm. And, uh, and God, wherever they are today, I pray you remind us of your great love for us, proven on the cross. Proven on the cross, God, that you're not going to quit on us. And I pray, God, for anybody here who wants to draw close to you, that you let them know that they can, that that door is always open. In Jesus' name, amen.